The Shooting Range. In this episode, the IS-2, a tank that could have a different look. A story of a bureaucratic failure. How they created the VG-33. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with how to fly the SO-8000 Narval. The SO-8000 Narval is one of those planes that are hard to understand at a glimpse. With its considerable battle rating, it doesn't have any outstanding qualities. Good top speed of 730 kph, decent maneuverability and climbing rate, considering the weight of this bird of course, and a bonus, a modern design with a pushing propeller. That's basically it. But know this, the Narval can surprise you, no matter if you're piloting it, or fighting against it. First of all, this is a strike fighter, which basically means that it's a strike aircraft, but more agile and with less underwing firepower. The Narval's got six 20mm cannons that shoot more than eight kilograms of depth in a second. And to spice it up, you've got a choice of a couple of 1,000 pound bombs and two kinds of rockets. That should be more than enough to inflict some serious damage to ground targets and then to intercept a couple of enemy strike aircraft and bombers. There's no need to count your bullets. You've got 1,500 of them. To successfully fly this machine, you need to remember a few important things. Try not to get into dogfights against enemy fighters, at least when you've got no backup. Your flaps are way too easy to lose, and flying without those against some Messerschmitt is a good idea only if you want to get yourself killed. Provoke your enemies to attack you head on, and then, as we told you in one of our guides before, shoot at them from the maximum distance. Pick a stealth, or an air target's belt, and push the trigger until there's no one left to shoot. Don't get too far from your teammates. Of course, being close to teammates won't guarantee your safety, but even the most inconsiderate of allies are often tempted to get an easy frag from the enemy that's got onto your six. When you're flying the Narval, it's absolutely okay to dive towards the ground right at the start of the match. Destroy some ground targets, earning some silver in the process, and then wait for the enemy strike aircraft to come by. As for the fighters, you'll have to improvise. And of course, a few pieces of advice on the actual flying, so that you don't crash before the fight begins. Don't touch the stick during takeoff. You'll only risk ripping your tail off. Set the flaps in the takeoff position and just let it gain some speed. The plane will get in the air on its own. If you wish to climb, check your readings and keep the speed at about 290 kph. Don't try to use the flaps at high speed you'll lose them in the blink of an eye. If you've ignored our words of advice and engaged in a dogfight, you'll have to make do without them. And now, let's talk about one of the most popular heavy tanks of World War II. By autumn 1943, the USSR started mass-producing a heavy tank called the IS-1. It weighed almost the same as the KV-1S, but it had a lot better armament and protection. Still, a simple boost of the basic parameters wasn't enough for the command. Its 85mm gun could pierce the German Tigers in the front, that's true, but only at a short distance. That solution obviously couldn't last so the IS-1 was quickly upgraded to the IS-2 with a 122mm gun. It was destined to become the most mass-produced heavy tank of the Second World War, and probably the best of them. The main advantage of the IS-2, and also the most significant change compared to the previous model, was the main weapon. The 122mm gun penetrated enemy Panthers in the front from two and a half kilometers. 
but even now, some skeptics still ask if it wouldn't be better to install a 100mm gun on the IS-2. It seemed to have the same penetration rate, but its fire rate was faster, and there was a possibility of increasing the ammo load. The usual argument against this idea is that the HE shells of the 122mm gun were a lot more powerful, allowing the tank to hit not only other vehicles, but also enemy fortifications. The truth, as always, is a bit more complicated. The decision to assemble the IS-2 with specifically this weapon wasn't harmful, but the HE shells weren't the main reason there. First of all, the works on this tank began in summer of 1943. At that moment, the choice didn't even exist. It was more than a year before the USSR engineers managed to mass-produce decent 100mm AP shells, and the 122mm gun was ready and had all the shells it needed. Of course, when they figured out how to make the 100mm ones, they tested them on the IS-2, but the results weren't promising at all. The unitary shells were quite long, so they'd only been able to get 29 of them inside the tank, against 28 of the 122mm shells. Later, the engineers miraculously enriched the ammunition up to 36 shots, but the tests showed that the loader couldn't reach the extra shells. Thus, the promised increased fire rate couldn't be achieved due to usability issues. The penetration rate should have been somewhat the same, but there also was a catch. If we fire at the same Panthers from those two guns, the 120mm one will penetrate it from two and a half kilometers distance and even more. As for the 100mm one, it will pierce the enemy's armor only from a distance of less than 1.5 kilometers. Also, the 122mm gun had a huge success against the later German tanks. They had solid but fragile armor that cracked like ice, even after a ricochet. And we're not even talking about the beyond armor effect. The IS-2 was amazing there. So, as it turns out, the powerful HE shells were just one of the many reasons to welcome the 122mm guns in the Soviet heavy tank for years and years. The IS-2 regiment was a great power-up for tank forces. These machines could often be spotted behind the attacking T-34-85, clearing the way for them by destroying tanks and destroyers from great distances. They proved to be a great anti-tank force as well. Moreover, they were almost as agile as the T-34-85, and the armor could withstand a direct hit from the PAK-40, a German anti-tank gun. Still, this kind of protection wasn't enough for the command, which led to the creation of the IS-3. But this is a story for another time. Now let's remember why corruption and bureaucracy aren't good for business. The VG-33 is surprisingly one of the most recognizable French fighters in the history of aviation, as well as one of the most mysterious ones. Its history is tied to the awful political situation in pre-war France. This was an aircraft built on contrasts. The number of absolutely genius ideas inside that plane is matched only by the number of dreadful ones. How did it happen? Let's figure it out. In 1936, France got under the leadership of the Front Populaire, a coalition of left-wing parties that tried to stabilize the shaky economy of the country. They organized a huge nationalization process of all the companies related to aircraft construction. There were hundreds and thousands of those. At the same time, the army demanded a cheap and mass-produced light fighter. The idea became complicated because of the greedy officials who understood that the nationalized corporations would be a lot less cooperative in bribing them for the contracts. But then they remembered that there were times when the planes were built out of wood, and who would have thought to nationalize plywood manufacturers? So they demanded the plane to be wooden. And the increased weight? Well, the country's got plenty of aircraft designers to figure this one out. They also managed to pick the engine for the engineers as well. 
The contract went to the freshly nationalized company called Arsenal, and the chief engineers thought it to be, shall we say, uh, not very easy. Still, an order is an order. So Marius Venice and Jean Galtier began to create a fighter of tomorrow. Part of the ministry demands were actually quite helpful. For example, the air-cooled 12-cylinder engine was almost ideal for their plans. On the other hand, the request for wooden materials meant huge restrictions in weight. For example, there was no way they could install progressive hydraulic flap and landing gear systems, only the good old pneumatic mechanisms. The wheels had to open only because of their own weight, and the tailwheel wasn't retractable at all, and looked like a descendant of the biplanes. The seemed-to-be-ideal engine also caused problems, as the original French model never left the test field. They had to swap it for the motor by the Hispano Suiza company. This one was cooled by water, not by air. Okay, things happen. Let's attach a liquid cooler under the plane, only to understand that the whole thing needs to be recalculated. The VG30 was no more. Instead, they created the VG33, an almost crazy attempt to realize the impossible demands of the ministry. The project wasn't closed only because it was favored by Pierre Co himself, the Minister for Air. Unfortunately, it probably would have been a lot better to have closed the wretched thing. As soon as they approved the mass production of the plane, they found a small but crucial flaw in the whole plan. France ran out of plywood. Everybody else switched to duraluminium ages earlier, and the minerals for the production simply weren't there. Moreover, the hispano suiza engines also weren't there. Or, to be fair, they were, but in numbers so small they had to share them between the manufacturers and fight for every single engine. As if that wasn't enough, the motor builders were always trying to get a more powerful engine, so they kept changing its parameters all the time. And the plane had to be recalculated for each engine specifically, even though they should have been the same. By 1940, Vernis and Galtier were desperate and took a page from Emile de Watin's book. They tried to reassemble the VG-33 around the American Allison and the British Merlin engines. They actually helped a lot, but by the time France capitulated, they only managed to send a couple of dozen of those potentially amazing fighters to the army. Now let's take a short pause and dream a little bit. Imagine Vernis and Galtier building the VG-33 as they wanted from the start, without mediocre and corrupt bureaucrats telling them what to do. A full metal fighter with hydraulic systems and progressive split flaps with position control. Its weight and size would enable adding two wing cannons to accompany the motor cannon, and there'd still be enough space to protect the fuel tanks and make a movable tail. Wait a second, what is that? Looks like a twin brother of the VG-33. Of course, it's the Folgore, a fighter with a bit different inside components that realized all those ideas. If Vernis and Galtier had a chance, they'd surely recalculated this plane for the metal, and it would have become an amazing fighter. But they were working for the government and couldn't step away from the orders of the people who didn't know a damn thing about aircraft design. The very same people who surrendered France to the enemy after only a month of active battles. Okay, enough dreaming. We'll just take a moment and make some conclusions. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a user called Matthew TV. Will you add French tanks? Hi Matthew, what do you think? Keep your eyes peeled, mate. Eh? The second question is by a player called Alvaro Hernan. Will you bring the game to the BA-3 or BA-6 Soviet armored trucks? We have really big plans concerning this line of armored vehicles, so you have every right to be optimistic. We hope that's not too vague. We just don't want to instill false hopes. I'm Anonymous, we hope we pronounce that right, asks, will you add the KV-6, the 
attempt number two. If you mean the KV-6, brackets Roman numerals, Behemoth, the monstrosity that was invented by Brian Fowler, then no, simply because such a tank didn't exist. If you mean the very real KV-6 that was armed with a flamethrower, then also no. There isn't much room for flamethrowing vehicles in our game. Lizek Baron writes, Can you please fix this? Every time the game crashes, I still, for some reason, have to pay repair costs. Hey mate, sounds nasty. Please contact our customer support. They might help you out. Then there's a rather short message from Comberry Comberry. Bruce for in-game voices. Ah, uh, well, it's possible. I could do that. If you want, it's not a problem. It depends what the devs want. The last and very important question comes from a user called Boiled Potato. I'm at McDonald's. Y'all want anything? I guess it would be rude to order some fries. Then we're good. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channels. See you on The Shooting Range.